Part 9 of Time Crime by H. Beam Piper. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Time Crime. Part 9. He spent the half hour transposition to police terminal sleeping. Paratime transpositions and rocket flights seemed to be his only chance to get any sleep. He was still sleepy when he sat down in front of the radio telescreen behind his duplicate of Tortha Karf's desk and put through a call to Narkhan equivalent. It was 0600 in India. The sector regional deputy subchief, who was holding down Ranthar Jard's desk, looked equally sleepy. He had a mug of coffee in front of him and a brown paper cigarette in his mouth. Oh, hello, Assistant Verkan. Want me to call Subchief Ranthar? Is he sleeping? Then for mercy's sake, don't. What's the present status of the investigation? Well, we were dropping boomerang balls yesterday while we had sun to mask the return flashes. Nothing. The Krautha have taken the city of Sohram just below the big bend of the river. Tomorrow, when we have sunlight, we're going to start boomerang balling the central square. We may get something. The wizard traders will be moving in near there, about now, Vol said. The Krautha ought to have plenty of merchandise for them. Have you gotten anything more done on narrowing down the possible area? The experts have just about pumped these slaves empty, he said. The local religion is a mess. Seems to have started out as a great mother cult. Then it picked up a lot of gods borrowed from other peoples. Then it turned into a dualistic monotheism. Then it picked up a lot of minor gods and devils, new devils usually gods of the older pantheon. And we got a lot of gossip about the feudal wars and faction fights among the nobility and so on, all garbled, because these people are peasants who only knew what went on on the estate of their own lord. What did we go on there? Vol asked. Ask them about recent improvements, new buildings, new fields cleared, new paddies flooded, that sort of thing. And pick out a few of the highest IQs from both timelines, and have them locate this estate on a large-scale map, and draw plans showing the location of buildings, fields, and other visible features. If you have to, teach them mapping and sketching by hypnomech, and then drop about five hundred to a thousand boomerang balls at regular intervals over the whole paratemporal area. When you locate a timeline that gives you a picture to correspond to their description, boomerang the main square in Soram over the whole belt around it to find Krautha with firearms. The deputy looked at him for a moment, then gulped more coffee. Can do, Assistant Verkan. I think I'll send somebody to wake up Subchief Ranthar right now. Want to talk to him. Won't be necessary. You're recording this call, of course. Then play it back to him. And get cracking with the slaves. You want enough information out of them to enable you to start boomerang balling as soon as the sun's high enough. He broke off the connection and sent out for coffee for himself. Then he put through a call to Novaland equivalent in western North America. It was 1530 there when he got Volthor Tharn on the screen. Good afternoon, Assistant Verkan. I suppose you're calling about the slave business. I've turned the entire matter over to Field Agent Skordran, gave him a temporary rank of Deputy Subchief. That's subject to your approval, and Chief Torthas, of course. Make the appointment permanent, Vol said. I'll have a confirmation along from Chief Torthas directly. And let me talk to him now, if you please, Subchief Volthor. Yes, sir. Switching you over now. The screen went into a beautiful burst of abstract art and cleared after a while, with Skordran Curve looking out of it. Hello, Deputy Skordran, and congratulations. What's come up since we had Nebu Hin Abinaz cut out from under us? We went in on that timeline that same night with an airboat and made a recon in the hills back of Kariba. Scared the fear of Safar into a party of Caleras while we were working at low altitude, by the way. We found the conveyor head site. Hundred-foot circle with all the grass and loose dirt transposed off it, and a pole pen, very unsanitary, where about two, three hundred slaves would be kept at a time. No indications of use in the last ten days. We did some pretty thorough boomeranging on that spatial equivalent over a couple of thousand timelines and found thirty more of them. 
I believe the slavers have closed out the whole Esseron sector operation, at least temporarily. That was what he'd been afraid of. He hoped they wouldn't do the same thing on the Kolgor sector. Let me have the designations of the timelines in which you found conveyor heads, he said. Just a moment, Chief's assistant. I'll photoprint them to you. Set for reception? Val opened a slide under the screen and saw that the photoprint film was in place, then closed it again, nodding. Scordron Curve fed a sheet of paper into his screen cabinet, and his arm moved forward out of the picture. On, sir, he said. He and Val counted ten seconds together, and then Scordren Curve said, Through to you. Val pressed a lever under his screen, and a rectangle of microcopy print popped out. That's about all I have, sir. Want me to keep my troops ready here, or shall I send them somewhere else? Keep them ready, Curve, Val told him. You may need them before long. Call you later. He put the microcopy in an enlarger and carried the enlarged print with him to the conveyor room. There was something odd about the list of timeline designations. They were expressed numerically in first-level notation, extremely short groups of symbols capable of exact expression of almost inconceivably enormous numbers. Val had only a general education smattering of mathematics, enough to qualify him for the chair of higher mathematics at any university on, say, the fourth-level Europo-American sector, and he could not identify the peculiarity, but he could recognize that there existed some sort of pattern. Shoving in the starting lever, he relaxed in one of the chairs, waiting for the transposition field to build up around him, and fell asleep before the mesh dome of the conveyor had vanished. He woke the list of timeline designations in his hand when the conveyor rematerialized on home timeline. He put it in his pocket, he hurried to an anti-grav shaft and floated up to the floor on which Tortha Karf's office was. Tortha Karf was asleep in his chair. Dalla was eating a dinner that had been brought into her, something better than the sandwich and mug of coffee Val had mentioned to Thal van Dras. Several of the bureau chiefs who had been there when he had gone out had left, and the psychist who had taken charge of the prisoner was there. "'I think he's coming out of the drug now,' he reported. "'Still asleep, though. We want him to awaken naturally before we start on him. They'll call me as soon as he shows signs of stirring.' The opposition's claiming now that we drugged and hypnotized Salgoth into making that Visigreen confession, Dalla said. Can you think of any way you could do that without making the subject incapable of lying? Pseudo-memories, the psychist said. It would take about three times as long as the time between Salgoth's Trod's departure from his apartment and the time of the telecast, though. You know much higher math, Val asked the psychist. Well, enough to handle my job. Neuron synapse interrelations, memory and association patterns, that kind of thing, all have to be expressed mathematically. Val nodded and handed him the timeline designation list. See any kind of a pattern there? he asked. The psychist looked at the paper and blanked his face as he drew on hypnotically inquired information. Yes. I'd say that... All the numbers are related in some kind of a series to some other number. Simplified down to kindergarten level, say the difference between A and B is maybe one decillionth of the difference between X and A, and the difference between B and C is one decillionth of the difference between X and B, and so on. A voice came out of one of the communication boxes. Dr. Nentrov, the patient's out of the drug, and he's beginning to stir about. That's it, the psychist said. I have to run. He handed the sheet back to Val, took a last drink from his coffee cup, and bolted out of the room. Dalla picked up the sheet of paper and looked at it. Val told her what it was. If those timelines are in regular series, they relate to the baseline of operations, she said. Maybe you can have that worked out. I can see how it would be a stated interval between the Esron sector lines to simplify transposition control settings. That was what I was thinking. It's not quite as simple as Dr. Nentrov expressed it, but that could be the general idea. 
we might be able to work out the location of the base line from that. There seems to be a break in the number sequence in here. That would be the timeline Skordran Kerr found those slaves on. He reached for the pipe he had left on the desk when he had gone to police terminal and began filling it. A little later, a buzzer sounded, and a light came on on one of the communication boxes. He flipped the switch and said, Verkan Vall here. Sothran Barth's voice came out of the box. They've just brought in Salgoth Trod servants. Picked them up as they came out of the house conveyor at the apartment building. I don't believe they know what's happened. Vall flipped a switch and twiddled a dial. A view screen lit up, showing the landing stage. The police car had just landed. One detective had gotten out and was helping the girl Zengana, who had been Zalgoth Trot's housekeeper and mistress to descend. She was really beautiful, Val thought, rather tall, slender, with dark eyes and a creamy, light brown skin. She wore a black cloak and under it a black and silver evening gown. A single jewel twinkled in her black hair. She could have very easily passed for a woman of his own race. The housemaid and the butler were a couple of entirely different articles. Both were about four or five generations from fourth-level primitive savagery. The maid, in garishly cheap finery, was big-boned and heavy-bodied with red-brown hair. She looked like a member of one of the northern European reindeer-herding peoples who had barely managed to progress as far as the bow and arrow. The butler was probably a mixture of half a dozen primitive races. He was wearing one of his late master's evening suits, a bright mellow pink which was distinctly unflattering to his complexion. The sound pickup was too far away to give him what they were saying, but the butler and maid were waving their arms and protesting vehemently. One of the detectives took the woman by the arm. She jerked it loose and aimed a backhand slap at him. He blocked it on his forearm. Immediately the girl in black turned and said something to her, and she subsided. Val said into the box, "'Barth, have the girl in the black cloak brought down to number four interview room. Put the other two in separate detention cubicles. We'll talk to them later.' He broke the connection and got to his feet. "'Come on, Dalla. I want you to help me with the girl.' "'Just try and stop me,' Dalla told him. "'Any interviews you have with that little item, I want to sit in on.' The proletarian girl, still guarded by a detective, had already been placed in the interview room. The detective nodded to Val, tried to suppress a grin when he saw Dalla behind him, and went out. Val saw his wife and the prisoner seated, and produced his cigarette case, handing it around. "'You're Zingana. You're of the household of Councilman Salgoth Trot, aren't you?' he asked. "'Housekeeper and hostess,' the girl replied. I am also his mistress." Val nodded, smiling. "'Which confirms my long-standing respect for Councilman Salgas's exquisite taste.' "'Why, thank you,' she said. "'But I doubt if I was brought here to receive compliments. Or was I?' "'No, I'm afraid not. Have you heard the newscasts of the past few hours concerning Councilman Salgoth? She straightened in her seat, looking at him seriously. No. I and Nindrandigro and Kalila spent the evening on Servsec 165. Councilman Salgov told me that he had some business and wanted them out of the apartment, and wanted me to keep an eye on them. We didn't hear any news at all. She hesitated. Has anything serious happened? Val studied her for a moment, then glanced at Dalla. There existed between himself and his wife a sort of vague, semi-telepathic rapport. They had never been able to transmit definite and exact thoughts, but they could clearly prehend one another's feelings and emotions. He was conscious now of Dalla's sympathy for the proletarian girl. "'Zingana, I'm going to tell you something that is being kept from the public,' he said. "'By doing so, I will make it necessary for us to detain you, at least for a few days. I hope you will forgive me, but I think you would forgive me less if I didn't tell you." "'Something's happened to him,' 
she said, her eyes widening and her body tensing. Yes, Zingana, at about twenty ten this evening, he said, Councilman Salgoth was murdered. Oh! She leaned back in the chair, closing her eyes. He's dead? Then again, statement instead of question. He's dead. For a long moment she lay back in the chair, as though trying to reorient her mind to the fact of Salgoth Trod's death, while Val and Dalla sat watching her. Then she stirred, opened her eyes, looked at the cigarette in her fingers, as though she had never seen it before, and leaned forward to stuff it into an ash receiver. "'Who did it?' she asked, the stone-aged savage who had been her ancestor not ten generations ago peeping out of her eyes. "'The men who actually use the needlers are dead,' Val told her. "'I killed a couple of them myself. We still have to find the men who planned it. I'd hoped—' You'd want to help us do that, Zingana. He side-glanced to Dalla again. She nodded. The relationship between Zingana and Salgoth Trot hadn't been purely business with her. There had been some real affection. He told her what had happened, and when he reached the point at which Salgoth Trot had called Tortha Karf to confess complicity in the slave trade, her lips tightened and she nodded. I was afraid it was something like that, she said. For the last few days, well, ever since the news about the slave trade got out, he's been worried about something. I've always thought somebody had some kind of a hold over him. Different times in the past, he's done things so far against his own political best interests that I've had to believe he was being forced into them. Well, this time they tried to force him too far. What then? Vol continued the story. So we're keeping this hushed up for a while. The way we're letting it out, Salgoth Trod is still alive on police terminal, talking under narco-hypnosis. She smiled savagely. And they'll get frightened, and frightened men do foolish things, she finished. She hadn't been a politician's mistress for nothing. What can I do to help? Tell us everything you can, he said. Maybe we can be able to take such actions as we would have taken if Salgoth Trot had lived to talk to us. Yes, of course. She got another cigarette from the case Val had laid on the table. I think, though, that you'd better give me a narco-hypnosis. You want to be able to depend on what I'm going to tell you, and I want to be able to remember things exactly. Val nodded approvingly and turned to Dalla. Can you handle this yourself? he asked. There's an audiovisual recorder on now. Here's everything you need. He opened the drawers in the table to show her the narco hypnotic equipment. And the phone has a whisper mouthpiece. You can call out without worrying about your message getting into Zingana's subconscious. Well, I'll see you when you're through. You bring Zingana to police terminal. I'll probably be there. He went out, closing the door behind him and went down the hall, meeting the officer who had taken charge of the butler and housemaid. "'We're having trouble with them, sir,' he said. "'Hostile, yelling about their rights, and demanding to see a representative of the Proletarian Protective League.' Vol mentioned the Proletarian Protective League with unflattering vulgarity. "'If they don't cooperate, drag them out and inject them and question them anyhow,' he said." The detective lieutenant looked worried. "'We've been taking a pretty high hand with them as it is,' he protested. "'It's safer to kill a citizen than bloody a prole's nose. They have all sorts of laws to protect them.' "'There are all sorts of laws to protect the paratime secret,' Vol replied. "'And I think there are one or two laws against murdering members of the Executive Council. In case PPL makes any trouble, they aren't here.' They have faithfully joined their beloved master in his refuge on Paul term. But one or both of them work for the organization. You're sure of that? The organization is too thorough not to have had a spy in Sagath's household. It wasn't Zingana, because she's volunteered to talk to us under Narcohip. So who does that leave? Well, that's different. That makes them suspects. The lieutenant seemed relieved. 
We'll pump that pair out right away. When he got back to Torthakarf's office, the chief was awake and doodling on his notepad with his multicolor pen. Val looked at the pad and winced. The chief was doodling bugs again, red ants with black legs and blue and green beetles. Then he saw that the psychist, Nantrov Dard, was drinking straight one-fifty-proof palm rum. "'Well, tell me the worst,' he said. "'Our boy's memory obliterated,' Nantrov Dard said, draining his glass and filling it again. "'And he's plastered with pseudo-memories a foot thick. It'll be five or six ten days before we can get all that stuff peeled off and get him unblocked.' I put him to sleep and had him transposed to police terminal. I'm going there myself tomorrow morning, after I've had some sleep, and get to work on him. If you're hoping to get anything useful out of him in time to head off this council crisis that's building up, just forget it. And that leaves us right back with our old friends, the wizard traders, Torthakarf added. And if they've decided to suspend activities on the Kolgor sector, too... He began drawing a big blue and black spider in the middle of the pad. Nentrov Dard crushed out his cigar, drank his rum, and got to his feet. Well, good night, Chief, Val. If you decide to wake me up before one thousand, send somebody you want to get rid of in a hurry. He walked around the deck and out the side door. I hope they don't, Val said to Torthakarf. Really, though, I doubt if they do. This is their chance to pick up a lot of slaves cheaply. The Krautha are too busy to bother haggling. I'm going through to Palterm now. When Dalla and Zingana get through, tell them to join me there. End of Part 9